Marvin Devine, Hoover, Axel, and you know how we do. <laughs> yeah, I got the juice, yeah, I got the juice Big game cool, make them look like cool Always play cool, that's the biggest move Forget what they doing, keep on doing How I made it right here in the booth I'm always pursued Cause of what I pursue That's greatness, yeah, I gotta make it I got things to lose Boy, uh, just wanna get in my crew But you can't get in my crew Me, XL, and Hoover Way too fireball When this joint drop Better call the truth And when you hear the trap Better race the rules Better race the rules Better race the rules Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Tonight, we have something extra special for you. The grateful Hod T. Chabib, MD and PKD expert extraordinaire is with us tonight. So uh, about Dr. Chabib, he is a, a fellow of the American Society of Nephrology, uh, ASM members who have distinguished themselves through excellence in practice or research. These individuals have outstanding credentials, high professional achievement, and are committed to the field and demonstrated scholarship. Our friend is all of that. He is a nephrologist, physician scientist, researcher, assistant professor at, of medicine at the Mayo Clinic. He is beloved 
in the polycystic kidney disease community due to his determination to cure PKD. He finished his undergraduate studies at the American University of Beirut, Lebanon, then his medical school at the University of Baumann, Lebanon. He joined Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston for his postdoctoral research fellowship in molecular, molecular nephrology and ion channels at the Alpha Lab at Harvard University. Afterwards, he trained at St. Elizabeth Medical Center, that's Tufts University. Those are all big names, by the way, in medical schools uh, for internal medicine. And then, of course, on to the Mayo Clinic for a three-year nephrology fellowship, followed by two years to develop his research program as a Mayo Clinic scholar. His specialties include general nephrology and hereditary kidney disease genetics. His clinical and research focus is advancing the medical care and preventing kidney failure in patients with polycystic kidney disease. His research examines molecular mechanisms that lead to cyst formation on ADPKD patients, that's the dominant adult version of PKD, and explores targeted treatment options. He established the Tovaptin Clinic at the Mayo Clinic to establish a safe and effective administration of the first FDA drug approved to slow uh, polycystic kidney disease. He is currently studying narval targets and molecules with promising therapeutic potential in ADPKD treatment. He is also leading innovative projects in delivering medical care to ADPKD patients globally. He's made the following statements on his Twitter account. Quote, my lifelong dream is that no one with ADPKD would ever need dialysis. The Mayo Clinic makes this dream feel closer to reality every day, exclamation mark, unquote. The Mayo Clinic says this about Dr. Chabib. Dr. Chabib dreamed of finding an alternative di to dialysis to treat patients with polycystic kidney disease, like his own father. Now, for the first time, there is hope. And check out in the comments, I left the link to the video from the Mayo Clinic with, uh, about his, him and his dad. Uh, uh, please check that out. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Dr. Chabib is with us tonight. Steve, start the show. Doc, how you doing? Doing great, thank you. Tell us, uh, did I state all your qualifications, uh, your education, your employment? Did I get all that correctly? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, the generous introduction, and uh, I'm very honored and humbled to be with you. So, thank you, Uncle Jim, for having me on the show, and uh, hopefully, your uh, audience will have a good time and and uh, kind of be informed on uh, polycystic kidney disease. Well, we'll make sure that we spread it around, Doc, so a lot of people see it. So thank you for yes. coming. I would much appreciate it. Tell us a little thank bit you. about your family background. Uh, what was your early life like? So uh, I was born in a smaller country in the, on the Mediterranean Sea, so uh, Lebanon. Um, I grew in, uh, in a smaller town, smaller city as well, um, known for wineries and agriculture. So my family's uh, business background is growing flowers and in the flower and wedding businesses. So I would actually grew up in, in that type of uh, business and environment. And I'm myself kind of a florist and a wedding event planner uh, as I grew up in that uh, family business. And when I was grow growing up, you know, my dream was to be a doctor, but I didn't know what kind of doctor uh, I would want to be. And then eventually things kind of uh, cleared up that I needed to be a uh, a PKD expert, and this is kind of my calling. So we'll we'll talk more on how this uh, came about, but uh, uh, that kind of drew, drew kind of drove the journey to come to the United States and come to uh, 
uh, the big centers to get the expertise uh, to drive that dream that you you mentioned, which is tr uh, trying to find a cure or a good treatment for polycystic disease. Very good, very good. Tell us a little bit uh, about your employment, your experience as a physician, a scientist, a geneticist. Tell us a little bit about what it is you do. Yeah, so um, again, the, given that the focus was for me to become an expert in knowing everything about polycystic kidney disease, uh, I realized that it's in, in order to be uh, able to find the cure or, or the best treatment or group of treatments, you need to uh, be the physician that knows everything about uh, to become a nephrologist, so a kidney doctor. Um, and um, and then you need, since it's a genetic disease, it's an inherited disease, you need to understand everything about the gen and about the genetics, about the, how it's uh, kind of inherited and what all the other factors in it. And in order to find the cure, you need to be the researcher and understand exactly how things are going in polycystic kidney disease so you can really nip it in the butt type thing. So, um, so uh, that's, how, you know, so this is kind of what I try to, um, to incorporate in my clinical practice as well as a researcher. So I'm kind of a physician scientist. So on both sides, I see the patients. I focus on patients with polycystic kidney disease, but all other uh, kidney diseases as well in my practice. And kind of the other hat is to be a researcher and a scientist to be able to link what we understand um, as a basic scientist or kind of the uh, exactly what's going on in this on the on the cell level and on the molecular level and then translate that into a treatment that's what the or understand what the patients need and then translate that into a treatment okay let's talk a little bit about um, some of your professional experience I, I read up on you uh, with the Mayo Clinic, and I noticed that you publish a lot of professional articles and recognized and respected publications mm -hmm. for other physicians, for other nephrologists, for other scientists, including articles about disease-modifying therapies. Can you talk about uh, your experiences with that and why you do that? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, again, so we're, I'm fortunate that I'm in one of the bigger centers, maybe the biggest center that sees uh, polycystic kidney disease patients. So we have an order of 5,000 patients that we have all the clinical information, all their information. So that helps us to understand um, all the patterns that polycystic kidney disease have uh, because they have very unique uh, things, uh, different things, uh, not only in the kidneys, but all the different organs. So that gives us, uh, when you have uh, this large amount of information, then you can make all these summaries and understand um, what the patients throughout the decades that went through Mayo Clinic and others to understand that disease. So I, through that experience, I try to summarize that and make it very simple for practicing nephrologists in the community and in, uh, everywhere in the world to give them what is the best practice. So what would be the best way to treat uh, particular uh, problems within polycystic kidney disease uh, patients. So we try to we try make it as simple and as because sometimes the nephrologists don't have enough time um, and they need kind of the summary and what's the best way to do uh, these things and, and their daily practice. And then in terms of disease modifying, uh, 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 so we try to understand uh, what polycystic kidney disease is for the patient. So not everyone who has kidney cysts has polycystic kidney disease, so it could be different type of diseases. So we focus on that. And then we focus on which, if somebody has polycystic kidney disease, who would benefit from uh, these lifelong treatments so we can slow down the disease. And right now there's one FDA approved drug that uh, of course we'll talk about later. So that's why we, saw, we say disease modifying drugs. So we're trying to slow down the disease so you don't reach end stage kidney or kidney failure. Uh, and then you delay that as much as you can. So you gain more time with your own kidneys. Okay. Uh, are you involved with uh, grant writing at all? Yes, so um, uh, being kind of that other hat being the scientist, uh, it's important to, um, uh, you know, in the science world, you need to, uh, you get the grants, so you get the funding. So you'll have uh, a lot of ideas 
and then you uh, you have someone who reviews them from your peers and then you'll get grants from either uh, the National Institute of, Institutes of Health or other uh, avenues such as philanthropists or uh, industry. So I'm involved in that and uh, thankfully I've, I've been uh, lucky in having few grants, intern career development grants within the Mayo Clinic as well as other grants from, from outside. Uh, that's how kind of we progress with the science is trying to have uh, what's the most important idea to research and, and understand so we can translate that into, into new treatments and into better lives, uh, uh, better outcomes for the patients. I, I do a little bit of reviewing of, as a patient reviewer for the PKD Foundation, and yes. also I've worked with the Department of, of Defense. So I've had that uh, experience from a patient's perspective of uh, reviewing uh, grant applications, and that but, sort of thing. That's why I asked the, the question. Abs absolutely. That's great. And that's a great addition for the PKD Foundation uh, this year by adding the voice of the patients and what's important for them. And, and I love that idea. So. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your your writings about the use of Talvaptin, the long-term administration of uh, Talvaptin. Uh, why is that significant and, and, and what are things that patients should be looking out for? Absolutely. So uh, Talvaptin gave, uh, it's, a, it's a treatment, it's an oral pill uh, that is now approved by the FDA to slow down the disease progression for polycystic kidney disease. So it was, it was uh, known to help uh, some other things in the kidneys, uh, such as the low sodium or what we call hyponatremia. But then it was repurposed, the same uh, company repurposed that for, for polycystic kidney disease. So just to make that distinction. Uh, and it's, it gave hope for the patients because now we have one FDA approved drug in the past. When somebody comes with polycystic kidney disease, they would tell them, okay, you have a certain amount of kidney function. Let's wait a few years. You're going to probably reach kidney, kidney failure at a certain age. And then when you come in, we'll try to talk about transplant or dialysis. So there was not a lot of things that the physicians or the patients could do to help uh, their disease and their outcomes. And now that there is one FDA approved drug, there, this paved the way for many other drugs that are now in clinical trials. And hopefully we have uh, many more options and different options, uh, either alone or together, to stall up to to put that big break on the on the disease and avoid the need for dialysis. Um, so tolvaptan, since it's the only FDA approved drug, so it wasn't it, it's not a very easy drug or medication to prescribe uh, because it makes you very thirsty. So you're going to drink a lot of water. You're going to make probably a lot of urine as well. Uh, so not a lot of um, not all the nephrologists or the kidney doctors are comfortable with using that. And then not all the patients are also comfortable using that. So we, we needed kind of some kind of guidance uh, to tell them how to prescribe it, who would benefit from that, how to follow up the blood work because the FDA has, has uh, uh, recommended monthly blood work for a certain period and uh, every three months and so forth. So it, it, it has some, uh, some work for, from both the patients and the physician and their group when we prescribe this medication, which is, again, it's an oral pill, it's twice a day, and it's taken for, for a long time. Um, so, um, uh, so that's how we put kind of that guide and I help uh, building up the protocols, I help build that 12 out 10 clinic with the help of our nurses and our uh, other providers. Uh, so, um, and, and I think that that uh, was well re uh, received within the community because, because again, I try to make as simple and as practical approaches. So for them, it becomes kind of simplify their lives as much as possible. Good, good. Talk to us about your, your article concerning advances in the management of uh, ADPKD. That, that's the adult version of PKD, right? The dominant version? Yes, so ADPKD is the autosomal dominant. I think in the past, maybe uh, before discovering what exactly were the genes or the mutations that caused the disease, it was called in the past uh, adult uh, the type because uh, most of the patients would reach end stage when within their midlife, so in their 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, the majority of the patients would reach that uh, kidney failure. So ADPKD or the autosomal uh, type, um, 
autosomal dominant type. Uh, so we put in, uh, again, other recommendations. So there's been, for the past 20 years, a lot of very good studies uh, trying to understand the disease, but how we can slow it down. So there was a study called the HALT study, for example, that looked at uh, lowering the blood pressure at a certain level, maybe a little bit lower than what uh, most of the patients would uh, uh, would need or would have, so other patients. So, for example, PKD patients would try to get their blood pressure lower in the 100 to 110, uh, for example, um, that upper number. So, for example, uh, this is one uh, aspect of trying to slow down also the disease by giving certain type of blood pressure medications and targeting a certain number there's other things such as uh, how much water someone would drink, uh, the diet that they need to, to follow. Uh, so we put this together as, uh, as uh, advances in the management. And also uh, we uh, divided the patients into the ones that are slowly progressive so they don't reach uh, kidney failure very early in life versus uh, the others who are two thirds of the patients would be rapidly progressive or at risk of reaching kidney failure uh, earlier than the others. And these patients, we need more aggressive therapy. One of them is giving them these disease-modifying drugs or tolvaptan, or if other drugs would be approved in the future. And then there are others that don't need as much uh, aggressive therapy, but they need good follow-up and good uh, therapy that is more conservative. So we put it together and we called it the optimized therapy. So everybody needs to uh, have uh, good follow-up, good blood pressure, uh, 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 watching the salt, improving their hydration, so how much water they need to, to drink. So all these kind of different uh, management items that sometimes the patients like to read these articles and they get a lot of information from them and the physicians also who are treating them. So. Talk about the relationship between polycystic kidney disease and polycystic liver disease. Because your Uncle Jim has both, so... Yes, um, so uh, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, uh, so um, uh, polycystic kidney disease, the major uh, phenotype or the major symptom that uh, the patients would have is a lot of cysts or a lot of fluid filled sacs and on the kidneys, the kidneys would grow with time and they become really big. A lot of patients would have the pain. So that's the major, everybody with ADPKD will have kidney cysts at certain and different uh, from mild to, se to severe, so at different severities. Now, not all the patients would have polycystic liver disease. The majority would have few liver cysts, and uh, most of the patients would not have a lot of trouble from these liver cysts. So they will have a few liver cysts, few cysts on the liver that sometimes could be uh, uh, painful. So it adds either a little bit of pain in the in the abdomen or uh, patients would feel that they get uh, full fast, so early satiety, uh, or they get the reflux or a uh, few different symptoms. So we don't do much about them, but then there's a smaller portion of patients where the liver, the cyst in the liver can be very uh, troublesome for them. So they can be very big, they can have huge livers, um, they, their, their belly or abdomen would be very distended all the time. They, their quality of life would be affected. So we have um, a few options depending on how how the cysts are affecting the liver. So a lot of patients uh, would have few liver cysts and we call them polycystic liver, but a smaller portion, especially the females, uh, would have a more severe polycystic liver and they would need more treatment and, and um, management for that. Okay. Let's talk about your special concentration research and focus in advancing medical care for preventing polycystic kidney disease in patients. Why did you choose this particular area? What was your motivation? It's not, the nephrologists are getting hard to find in medical school these days. Yes. So I'm wondering, why did you pick this particular area? Yeah, so uh, PKD has a, a special meaning for myself and, and uh, it's very dear to my heart and that's why I wanted uh, to be a PKD specialist. Uh, so I want to be a nephrologist uh, first because I, so my father has polycystic kidney disease and I've seen uh, how uh, he was treated back home in Lebanon. So he had very, 
had great nephrologists who took great care of him uh, through his dialysis, when he was on dialysis, then through his transplant years, um, and then um, also at, at, at end of life. Uh, so we lost him a few months ago. So that, that inspired me um, to be a nephrologist. And then uh, what my father went through, especially through dialysis, and it was kind of growing up, I was seeing him uh, going every other day, how he was trying to take care of his family, but dialysis is not an easy thing to do. It's, a, it's another full-time job. You have to go three and a half to four hours to a dialysis center. You're going to be wiped out afterwards and three times a week. So, so I saw how much he was going through and I said, well, we need, you know, that's too much for, for one person to go through and too much for one family to go through. I saw how much, um, just going, just being on dialysis and what PKD has cost to him, but also to his family. So myself, my siblings, my mother, and also his business. So it's, it has kind of a ripple effect. So I saw that although PKD, people talk about numbers, there's only one every 500 to 1,000 uh, people on, uh, and then maybe 12 million people. Some people talk about it as a rare disease. But in fact, when one patient with PKD gets to kidney failure, there's tens and tens of people who really get affected. Uh, his immediate family, his friends, his his, his neighbors, and his, his entourage. So that inspired me to really just become the expert. And then I, my dream was to find a new treatment and try to understand it. I didn't know how I'm gonna get there because I was coming from a very small country. You have to go through different s steps. And then, and then one thing led to the other and you just stay determined to, to become uh, what you want, and then um, with little faith and little determination, I think uh, people achieve a lot. So, so that was kind of my motivation to, and that's still my motivation. I, I think there's still a lot of work to do, uh, but at least I'm kind of on the on the track uh, to get there. Hopefully, no, as a, a a PKD patient, we're grateful for your your hard work, doctor, and, and please accept my condolences on the loss of your dad. I went through the same thing, so I understand that very well. Let's talk for a minute about the mechanism of how PKD comes about. How would you describe what happens? Yes, so it's uh, it's actually a very, uh, it's amazing how one small thing can lead to this, what we call systemic disease. So a disease that's affected, affecting the whole body just one small coding problem and the DNA. So it's an inherited disease, it's genetic disease. So um, most of the patients uh, would have someone in the family that has the polycystic kidney disease. But then there's a smaller portion where maybe it starts from, it starts from uh, kind of scratch, we call it de novo. So when, the, when, um, uh, uh, when someone is still in conception, there, there are still just few cells. Sometimes there's a defect in the DNA, and then that leads to the polycystic kidney disease. But kind of in general, there's a, a mutation or a defect in the DNA. So the, think about the DNA as the code, uh, uh, the code that that directs how the proteins are made in our body, and then that would give us our body, right? So there's just one single. Uh, defect. So instead of, for example, one certain code of A, it becomes C. And that causes all this problem. Um, so the mutation would be in two genes. One is called PKD1 and the other is PKD2. PKD1 is the most common. About 85% of the patients would have that. PKD2 is another gene and it's less common and less severe. Um, so either way, if you have a mutation in one or the other, then there's a defect in what we call the polycystin. So these genes will uh, code for the protein called polycystin. And these polycystin would become defective, so they won't uh, do their work. We're still, although we discovered these, uh, the scientists have discovered these genes in the 1990s, so 1992, 1994, um, we still don't know a lot, or we still don't know 100% how, how they work and what they exactly do. So we're trying to understand that better. But we know that if there's less functional or these, prote these proteins, if they're not doing their work, um, they don't sense uh, certain normal things in the kidney and in the urine. And then um, there's a lot of 
I'm not going to be very technical. So there's a lot of signaling pathways, so a lot of defect within the cell, and uh, that makes uh, that tells the cell to uh, proliferate more. So it it, can, it it divides more. So it's kind of a, a benign tumor, if you want to say. So these cells in the kidney starts to make more cells, and then they make also uh, more fluid secretion. So they kind of secrete more fluids, and then eventually they, these cells become a fluid-filled sac, and then there's more fluids that keep actually going in and out uh, multiple times a day. So it's not, uh, it's a very dynamic, it's a very alive uh, structure in the kidney. So, and there will be hundreds of these kidney cysts uh, in the kidney, the kidney would grow, and then it, it starts pushing on the other uh, normal kidney, the filters and others. And then with time, you start losing the kidney function. Some patients would reach kidney failure in their 40s, as I mentioned, and some others maybe in their 70s, 80s, and a very small portion might not reach uh, kidney failure. So it's, it's very uh, different within all the ADPKD patients and even within the same family. So you might uh, you might have a certain experience with polycystic kidney disease, and then your sibling or your cousin or your parent uh, might have either worse or better disease. Uh, uh, it depends on what you inherited from your other parent, but also how you behaved throughout your life. If you, uh, uh, if you had a good diet, if you were healthy, have healthy lifestyle, if you were drinking water, um, and so forth. So uh, a lot of patients really can change their outcomes if they were very aware of their uh, situation and they became very healthy and they kept their blood pressure well controlled, their weight well controlled, they drank a lot of water. So although we BKD patients are born with this disadvantage of that mutation and it's a, it's a chronic disease, uh, it has a lot of burden. We can talk about that, how just knowing that you have it or you might have it has a lot of impact because you know that you have something wrong in you. You don't feel it until you're in midlife. And then in midlife, you have to stop everything and say, okay, well, what do I do? I need to be on dialysis. I need to figure out my transplant situation and so forth. And then there's also the burden of passing it on to your children and, and so forth. So uh, maybe I, I said a lot of things. We can dissect it. In the no, 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 no. You're doing great. You're doing great. Um, in, in fact, I, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. You, what are your observations about the general experiences that a, a PKD patient has? Not from a medical standpoint, what happens, but what patients tell you that they experience? Um, so the, the patients themselves, uh, a lot of times they don't have symptoms. So they, um, so to go about it, for example, so, a lot of patients don't want to know that they have the disease. They have polycystic kidney disease. And they say, okay, well, I'm not feeling anything. I know that I'm at risk of, I have 50% risk of having the disease, but I'm going to go on with my life. And if something happens later and I get the diagnosis, I'll deal with it. So there's that one portion of these patients. Another portion would have a lot of flank pains. They might have uh, blood in the urine. They might start having the high blood pressure early on or they get the diagnosis one way or the other, whether it's uh, on purpose or uh, because they try to get screened and they want to figure out, or um, they they had, for example, an appendicitis and they had the uh, scan and then they figure out that they have the cyst. Uh, so either way, um, uh, when you know, when, you've, when the patients, the PKD patients have a family history, so they've seen their parents, grandparents, what they've went through, and perhaps maybe the grandparents, because there wasn't good back then, a very good medical uh, help. Maybe they've seen some negative uh, experience from PKD. Maybe they've seen their grandparents go through dialysis and pass pass away very early in life. So that affects them uh, subconsciously. That you know, maybe I'm gonna have the same uh, path like my father, like my grandfather, and so forth. Um, so these, the, the PKD patients have a lot of, uh, again, burden on just thinking, uh, and each person uh, 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 kind of address or uh, reacts and have a different perspective on, on, on difficulties. But eventually, again, this, this is uh, a family matter in a sense, because even if you don't have PKD, 
they know that other family members they would they would like to be the donors for the members who got affected so everybody is is in it and everybody and that's what i see usually in pkd families they they know that they love to each to help each other so even if they were the lucky ones they didn't have the disease they're going to be uh, standing by their other siblings or cousins and what have you. Um, so again, so PKD patients, um, you know, we as physicians we go through, you know, yeah, let's look at blood pressure, let looks at let's look at your kidney function, creatinine, and so forth, and we forget how you know a chronic inherited disease can have an effect on 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 the patient growing because it's not something that you get diagnosed with in your 50s and then they tell you oh you have two years to do this or or right away you need to be you get diagnosed with it's another disease and you need to be on dialysis or get the transplant right away so it's something that is growing it's it's in the works for years and years and years until you become really sick and the other part of it that i, I get a lot of calls from parents that they don't know how to approach uh screening their kids um, and they feel they feel this kind of burden and this guilt that they're, you know, did I pass it on to my kid? Uh, when should I screen my 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 kids? And some actually, I, I've seen cases where the parents know that their kids have it, but they 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 don't know how to approach or how to tell them. And um, and I'm talking also not only in the United States. So we have different. There's different cultures. There's different ways of how parents and other cultures and other places in the world. Uh, approach these things. So here, the patients had the right to know, but in other places, they kind of uh, hide that uh, information from uh, from other patients. So this is kind of a little bit different uh, than here. Okay, let's let's talk a little bit about um, solutions to the particular problems that that you raise. Let, let, let's talk about your experiences with genetic testing. What is genetic testing? Why would you go through this? What are the benefits? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? Absolutely. So uh, with polycystic kidney disease, um, the majority of the time we can make a diagnosis without needing a genetic test. So for ADPKD, it's very obvious uh, when there's hundreds of kidney cysts, when the kidneys are very enlarged, when the kidney function is on the lower side, uh, and with the family history, uh, you know, knowing that they had uh, other family members that did reach kidney failure at certain age and they had polycystic kidneys. So most of the times we just need to look at either an ultrasound or a CT scan MRI of the abdomen and we tell the patient you have it or you don't have it. Now, in some instances, we uh, things are might be ambiguous, so we don't have an exact uh, 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 diagnosis or uh, that smaller portion of the patients who uh, don't have a family history uh, so we need to figure that out. So for these patients, it's indicated to have the genetic test. And then there's now we're learning that there's other things that can mimic ADPKD. So they are, uh, they're not as common, so they are rarer diseases, but they can, uh, you know, I can give an example of a family who was for years known to have polycystic kidney disease, but then we figure out this is not ADPKD, this is something else. Uh, and that's something, that new disease that got discovered has other implications on how to screen with other things. They might have extra risks of, of different other diseases associated with that mutation. So what I'm saying, and what I'm trying to kind of give the message is that these days, uh, genetic testings are more accessible and uh, cheaper, and they're covered most of the times by the insurance companies. Uh, so it's important to have a, a very firm diagnosis. It's important to know 100% what the patient has, because that has implications on how, uh, what to expect in the future from what the kidneys are gonna do. Are they gonna reach kidney failure at a certain point? We can predict these. Um, uh, and then there's other things that mimic polycystic kidney disease that might be much milder, that might need other screening and different things. So in this, uh, st uh, in this state of age, I think it's important to have a 100% uh, diagnosis. So if someone has just 1% uh, doubt that this is ADPKD, they should get the genetic testing. And I foresee in the future, probably everyone, it would become a routine test, like checking your creatinine, your kidney function. It, it, it's gonna become very easy to have. 
Now, still, uh, you mentioned what's the implication of having the, ge the genetic test. It uh, doesn't have more implication um, than having the diagnosis. So having the diagnosis of polycystic kidney disease can have implications on perhaps life insurance. Sometimes we, we caution the patients that maybe get your life insurance and everything in check before you go and find out if you have polycystic kidney disease or not. There's now new laws that protect the patients. Uh, and it's not uh, because in the past, um, uh, the patients are uh, penalized in a sense, uh, uh, or they're saying, okay, well, you have uh, ADPKD, then we're not going to give you health insurance. We're not going to give you life insurance. We're not going to, it's going to affect your employment. Uh, and this is, uh, so there's a lot of flaws now that protect the patients. And this is thanks to uh, a lot of patients, advocates like yourself uh, that went to, uh, Washington DC and they advocated and they got new laws. So so these days it's it's less of a problem, but I think the life insurance remains potentially uh, uh, an issue. So um, it's important to have the life insurance before you go and find out if you have it or not. Uh, that's still now in the works. So before doing genetic testing, before doing a, an ultrasound of the kidney, it's probably important to discuss uh, all the implications with your physician and then figure out what's the best way Sometimes if you're still in college, if the patients or the individual is still in college and they still don't want to deal with health issues, they want to kind of get through that, maybe it's better to wait a few years before they get the screening. But I like to give another uh, take home message now that we understand better post kidney disease. I, I prefer if everybody gets the diagnosis early because now we have a lot of ways so uh, to try to slow down the disease, including medications, but also uh, blood pressure, uh, staying healthy, being aware, screening for the brain, aneurysms. So there's a lot of things that um, if you know that you have the disease, you might make your life better uh, and your outcomes better in the future. Okay. Um, one member of our audience, uh, my friend Candy, has been asking about the relationship between polycystic kidney disease and polycystic ovary disease. Is there a relationship between the two or are they different? Just the name. There's no connection between the two. Uh, so polycystic ovary disease is also a common uh, uh, disease, but it, it's not related to the PKD mutations or ADPKD. No, okay. no relations. Yeah. All right. You have spoken a lot about um, the involvement of the mechanism with cyst formation in uh, ADPKD. Why is cyst formation so important in the study of PKD? What, what does it do to the kidneys? What, why do you spend so much time with it? Yeah, so this is kind of, um, the, this is the bottom line why the kidneys fail is because uh, the kidneys are making hundreds of these uh, cysts. And these cysts, when they grow, they're pushing all these filters, but also they're causing a lot of inflammation around them and scarring. Um, and so uh, the idea is if we understand how the kidney is making these cysts, we can start very early in life, maybe even in the teenage, and put that break on these cysts so they don't grow. So maybe we still have a few small cysts, but they won't grow and they become kind of football size kidneys. They'll be just same size, and and hopefully with understanding how the cysts are may, are forming, we can find the actual treatments. Uh, so tovaptan is one of them, uh, but it's still kind of a smaller break. We need a uh, multiple other breaks and maybe a big big break to stop the the cysts from forming. Okay, uh, talk to us a little bit about the test to detect polycystic kidney disease, because I think that some patients are under the impression that this is big, hairy testing. So t tell us a little bit about what it involves to find out if or if not you have PKD. Yeah. So um, so the patients who want to know if they have or they don't have PKD, that means that they, they have someone in the family and they're trying to right. see uh, if they have it or not. So if one of the parents have the polycystic kidney disease, each child have their own chance 50% chance of having it or not having it. It's kind of a, a flip coin. So when the someone with that risk wants uh, to know if they have it, 
um, we have uh, very uh, the, uh, very good diagnostic criteria, or we have guidelines on how we diagnose it by doing an ultrasound of the kidney. So the first step would be, if you want to know uh, if you have PKD, is to go and get the kidney ultrasound, which is easy to get, cheap, and there's no radiation. And that even could be done through the primary care provider. And then depending on the age and how many kidney cysts in each kidney, then we can say, okay, you have polycystic kidney disease, yes or no. Now, in other situations where you, when you really need to know if you have PKD or not, such as when you're like uh, younger in your 20s or 30 and you want to give a kidney to a sibling who has or to a parent who has polycystic kidney disease, then we do a more defined, more, de more uh, confirm uh, confirmatory di diagnostic test. One is CT scan, or we, sometimes we get genetic testing. Uh, uh, for these patients to make really sure that they don't have PKD. But basically kind of the bottom line is an ultrasound can give us a lot of information if if the patient has it or doesn't have it. Okay. Talk to us about the importance of early detection and early treatment with polycystic kidney disease. Why is it important to find it early and what do we do about it? So it's important to find early uh, because now we have uh, things to, again, uh, slow down the disease. Uh, it's important to find it early because you don't want to keep uh, 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 your blood pressure very high for many years without treatment because that's going to affect your blood vessels, your heart, and so forth. That's going to affect also your kidney function. Um, so if you're diagnosed early, you're going to be checked uh, by medical professionals more frequently to make sure that your blood pressure is, is better. We're gonna give the patients all these different uh, recommendations for the diet, for the water intake. And then we're gonna look at uh, the patient if they're diagnosed early. Uh, we're gonna look if they're gonna be eligible for these new treatments. One of them is tolvaptan, and in the near future, we're hoping for more. So uh, by diagnosing early, again, we can uh, get the most uh, out of these treatments, because every, uh, let's say, every four years of tolvaptan, you can push the, the uh, ESRD or the kidney failure date by one year. So let's say a patient got diagnosed at age 20, and then they're going to expect it to reach end stage by age 55, and that's 35 years of treatment, and that's a lot of years that you push the patient, you push the kidney failure and the need for dialysis or transplant down the line. So this is the take home message uh, for that. And then, um, um, yeah, so the, usually they, they stay healthier and, and they're aware of, 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 uh, of the disease. So, so uh, I think that that was the main point I wanted to make. Okay. We talked about polycystins earlier. What I'd like to ask you about now, the specific area and focus of your work is calcium disruption. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yes. Um, so uh, when I mentioned the polycystins, the, the proteins that um, uh, are defected in, in PKD, they actually have a complex called polycystin complex. So there's the PKD1 gives PC1, PKD2 gives PC2, and they make a complex. And that complex sits on a very, very tiny structure called cilia. And that cilia is, uh, it detects kind of the, the how the urine is, is going down the, the down the tubules or down the uh, uh, tubes of the, the very small tubes of the kidney. So in normal normally these uh, sensations would lead for the calcium to go inside the cell, and that cell the the cell uses that calcium inside the cell to signal different things. So if the, it goes up or if it's going up and down, it tells the cells to do something, and then if it's going lower or higher, it tells the cell to do something else. So in PKD, we, th uh, we believe that there's less of that calcium inside the cell, and that's the main uh, thing that's going wrong. And then there's uh, many other things that go wrong down, down the line. One of them is uh, other molecules like cyclic AMP that goes up, and that leads to the kidney to make more, ki more kidney cells to, to divide more and to make more uh, fluids. So we uh, my personal opinion is that if we target that early problem, 
then all these other problems down the line would be better. And then uh, that would give us kind of the best uh, target or treatment options. Um, so that's why we're trying to, to study that more in details, trying to figure out uh, new ideas on how we can test hundreds of thousands of drugs uh, on a very early level and then move the ones that are promising to the next levels uh, in testing. So what we call high throughput screening. So this will increase, will increase our chances of figuring out uh, which is a better uh, uh, treatment uh, for PKD. Talk to us a little bit about the Covaptin Clinic at, at Males. Um, tell us about the role that you and your team played in the development and acceptance of Telvaptin and what you folks are currently doing to help PKD patients. Yeah, so Telvaptin came about uh, um, before I came actually to, to Mayo and it's, uh, it's through the leadership and the, uh, and the uh, vision of Dr. Vicente Torres. A lot of the PKD patients know this name. So he is, uh, he is the director of the PKD center at Mayo. Uh, and that's why actually I came to Mayo is to work with him and to be mentored by him. So it, it went, it goes all the way back to, I think to the early 2000s uh, when him and uh, late, uh, the late Dr. Vicente uh, Gatone uh, decided to um, understood a little bit the disease at the time or more of the disease at the time and decided to target that cyclic MP I mentioned just earlier. And there's a way of trying to lower that cyclic MP in, in particular cells of the kidney and they tried uh, something similar to tolvaptan. It was a different molecule. And they showed in the PKD animals, uh, if you give that medication, then the cysts are much smaller. Um, and they don't reach kidney uh, disease uh, as early. So that was the basis of how, how things went on. Uh, and the clinical trials were developed, uh, developed by the uh, manufacturer of uh, tolvaptan, the, the company is Otsuka. So they funded uh, multi multinational, multi-center trials of more than 1,400 patients. And through through many years, through at least three years of treatment for Tolvaptan, this got uh, approved in Europe. And then the FDA required an additional clinical trial for another year, and that was done. Uh, and there was many centers throughout the States, many patients with PKD, who without them, uh, the research wouldn't have been done. So, um, so there's a lot of people involved in, in the process of studying if it works on, on patients or not. And then later on, uh, the FDA approved it, and that was uh, an endeavor from the pharmaceutical company, but also from the steering committee, including Dr. Torres and others. Uh, Dr. Perron, uh, a lot of people know these uh, big names in, in PKD in the United States. So they were uh, the key in getting this approved. And uh, so my role is, uh, was to, within the clinical trials, I was, I was uh, under Dr. Torres. And then later I developed the protocols on how we can, after it got approved, how we can make it easy for the patients and the uh, kidney doctors to prescribe it. And we developed these protocols and the Tolvaptan clinic was kind of a model in the, at Mayo on how we make it easier uh, for everyone because there's a lot of blood tests that needs to be done and we titrate, so we start with smaller dose, we go up to a bigger dose, and there's a lot of uh, work involved early on, especially when, when you prescribe uh, Tolvaptan. And uh, the last question you mentioned what we're doing uh, more, there's other clinical trials right now. So there's, uh, so, we so we offer Tolvaptan first uh, for everyone who is eligible. Some patients prefer not to be on it for different reasons. And some patients uh, uh, might not be eligible, so they go on for other clinical trials. Um, so that's that's uh, one immediate thing that hopefully in the near future, since it's in the pipeline at the clinical trials, we hope that other drugs would be would be approved. And then the other things that Mayo uh, PKD Center is doing, including myself, is trying to figure out to understand better the disease, and then figure out. Uh, uh, if we can uh, find new targets and new treatments and then try to test them uh, early on on PKD animals and then uh, move it to clinical trials. So there's a, lo a lot of excitement, uh, a lot of work uh, within the Mayo, but also different centers in the United States, different centers in Europe and elsewhere in Australia. There's a nice clinical trial on drinking water, so a water prescription for PKD. 
there's other clinical trials also in Europe uh, that are ongoing as well. So a lot of exciting uh, things for PKD patients. Excellent. I, I, I just wanted to say to you, congratulations on receiving the Team Science Award for the Mayo Clinic 2020. Yes, thank you. So the, again, it's a team science. So a, a lot of people, uh, uh, a lot of people at the Mayo uh, PKD Center, we are more than 60, 65 uh, physicians and scientists. And we, uh, the nice thing is we kind of have a multidisciplinary approach. So that's why it's a team science. So we have the radiologists and the uh, scientists in radiology who help us understand uh, the kidneys, help us find new, uh, what we call biomarkers, uh, so trying to know who really uh, has mild disease or who has severe disease in different ways and trying to predict as accurately as possible their need for dialysis so we can so we can uh, uh, understand because that's an important information for the patient is when do they reach end stage kidney disease or kidney failure. So with the scientists, with the radiologists, with uh, the clinicians, it's kind of a nice team approach and uh, and uh, we were fortunate to have that type of uh, award last year. Congratulations. I also wanted to say congratulations for, and uh, to thank you for advocating for us during ASN Kidney Week in Washington, D.C. I'm not the only one that ends up with these politicians. Yes. <laughs> Trying, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a team effort from, from, from that as the academician, uh, the people who are, and the academic centers and the community nephrologists, the patients, and the PKD Foundation has been really uh, instrumental in, in moving things uh, forward um, uh, and what, what is ne really needed for PKD patients. Well, we appreciate that very much, doctor. Let's, we're in the home stretch. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about COVID-19. What, what steps are you recommending to your patients concerning COVID-19 and specifically what I'm looking at are the vaccination issues because it's my understanding that many of us that have had two vaccinations, we may be getting in line for a third. Sure. Can you talk to us about that? Yes, so um, so with polycystic kidney disease, it depends on, on your, uh, before transplantation, it depends all, uh, on where you are in terms of your kidney function. So which stage of chronic kidney disease the patient is at. So early stages, probably there's not a lot of risk, but there's, it's still considered a chronic disease. You have, you might have high blood pressure, you might have a little bit lower kidney function. So since it's a chronic disease, it's important to uh, uh, discuss with your physician if you're able to get the vaccination. And it's it's recommended to have it if you there's no contraindication because that, as we know, uh, having a chronic kidney, chronic disease in general, and especially chronic kidney disease, having COVID infection will, will put you at high risk from having a little bit more complications, uh, God forbid. So it's important to get vaccinated. Um, if you have more advanced kidney disease, it's very, very important to really get vaccinated and make sure that you stay away from uh, infected people, make sure all the hygiene and all the, everybody knows these uh, now, by now. Now, in terms of after transplant, uh, there's, uh, we're understanding more that two vaccines are not enough to bring the really the levels needed but maybe a third dose might bring it up to a very protective level um, so uh, patients with kidney transplant who have a little bit less immunity because uh, because you are on medications that lower your immune system so you don't reject your kidney uh, then you're so it's it's a different um it's, it's a different biology and and now we have this the data to say perhaps a third dose is, is needed, and there's gonna be more recommendation from uh, the societies of transplantation and the nephrology societies to, to give that guidance to the physicians and the patients. Uh, so it's important to stay up to date, to stay in touch with your physicians, uh, to stay away from sick, uh, from sick, other sick people, and or from big gatherings if, you, you're, if you're not sure if everybody is vaccinated or not. So we have to stay vigilant, uh, there's different variants right now, and um, hopefully we get through this pandemic, which has affected everybody. Uh, and but especially patients with uh, post kidney disease, with kidney diseases, with the transplanted patients, they are a little bit more worried than others, uh, perhaps. Okay. Was there anything 
that I left out? Is there anything that you would like to add that I forgot to discuss with you that you feel is very important? Uh, well, we discussed a lot of things, and thank you for this opportunity. This has, has been fun, so thank you again. I think we discussed uh, most of the things. I just want to just reemphasize that uh, you're not, uh, so for patients and families who have PKD, you're not alone. Sometimes you might feel that way because your physicians, local physicians, maybe don't understand as well as you do polycystic kidney disease. So it's important to reach out to the community, to other patients who have it, or maybe to come to other play, different uh, clinics. So now on the PKD Foundation, you can f uh, find out based on your zip code, where is a clinic that deals uh, better with PKD than others. So try to advocate for yourself as a patient. So uh, if you feel that the decision made by your physician or others uh, doesn't fit you well, try to have a second opinion or just try to educate yourself as much as you can to, to improve your outcome. So from my personal experience and from my father, I think the best advocate was himself and my mother. And without that, um, probably he wouldn't have made it to the age of 68, uh, but he was, he had 20 years of kidney transplantation. Um, and I, I was just mentioning before we got online uh, that he thought every day was, was a, his blessing and was a, a bonus day for him. So it, it's kind of, it's, it's different for PKD families when, when you've, when you appreciate really every day and every moment and, but it's important to advocate for yourself. And the last uh, take home message is um, don't feel guilty that you have it or you don't have it. Don't feel guilty that you pass it on. This is not, this is not, uh, this is not your fault, right? This is an inherited disease. It's a mutation. It got passed on. Uh, it's important to realize that and then just do everything you can to change uh, the outcome. You, you might not have the same uh, path as, as other family members. You might have much better path and you can, change it uh, by taking actions for, for your health. Okay. Well, l let me ask one more that, that comes from the audience. They were talking about the um, two shots for the, the COVID treatment, and there's been some discussion in the writings about mixing shots. In other words, if you had Pfizer before, can you take Moderna or can you take AstraZeneca or, or some other variation? Do you have an opinion on that? I'm not an expert, uh, so I know the limitations I uh, I have. So I prefer not to give uh, a, a, a solid recommendation on that. I think the best way to go about it is is going back to your local provider because each patient is different. Uh, and then CDC and uh, uh, usually are actually uh, putting all these guide uh, the, these guidance. So I would prefer to uh, leave it to the experts so I don't make any. Uh, mixed messages and it's important to, to stay uh things are changing so it's important to stay up to date with with these okay doc i appreciate very much you you coming on and, and taking time with yes. us tonight and on behalf of all my pkd patient friends i just want to say thank you very much for educating us tonight. thank you for having me this this has been a pleasure thank you you're very welcome you're very welcome thank you for coming on ladies and gentlemen coming up July 30th, Dr. Mulgrew, uh, a nephrologist, is going to come on and talk to us about transportation and later life after the age of 50. Can you or can you not donate? Our good friend Shane Blanchard is going to come on with his donor August 6th. We're, we're going to have a discussion about what's going on with Shane. He has a very interesting um, history. August 27th, tentatively, uh, the cooking doc wants to come back on with us. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, kidneys and medical nutrition therapy with a medical nutritionist, a friend of his. So watch this space. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.
ride or die.